Hi, and welcome to another in-depth technology presentation by Polyolygon. Today we'll be covering an up-and-coming technology called the blockchain and its potential impact in higher education. The blockchain, also known as distributed ledger technology, has had tremendous buzz in the financial world. But how applicable is it for education? Well, in March 2017, Educause published an article outlining what they think will be the most important technology to change higher education. It wasn't the social web, mass online open courses, virtual reality, or even artificial intelligence. They wrote that these are all components layered on top of something new, all enabled and transformed by an emerging technology called the blockchain. In another 2017 report by Europe's Joint Research Center, Professor John Dominck is quoted as saying, the centralized model of present-day learning is no longer sustainable. Indeed, blockchain technology allows for a total disintermediation and disaggregation of education. Blockchain technology may hold the answer to securely and verifiably collating the outcomes of this new distributed learning reality. Professor Dominique holds the position of director at the Knowledge Media Institute, an innovation lab at the Open University, the UK's largest university. What he said contains a lot to unpack, especially the Ds, disintermediation, disaggregation, and distributed learning, all of which he says will be enabled by blockchain technologies. We know that disintermediation involves removing intermediaries, aka middlemen. We know that disaggregation involves separating something into its component parts. And we know that distributed learning is learning independent of time and place. These days we can learn anywhere. We would like to present three more concepts along with these that we're also going to be covering. Self-sovereignty and identity, owning one's own data and identity, transparency and provenance, having a history and authenticity of ownership, and immutability, the inability for anyone to modify existing data. In this presentation, we'll discuss how these concepts are set to transform industries like education through blockchain technology. We'll do that by first giving you a high-level overview of this technology. We won't need to get into esoteric details, but there are a few revolutionary concepts in how blockchains are designed that really create its social value proposition. This will take about 15 minutes to explain. We'll then review how this technology is currently being used across industries. And finally, we'll speculate along with industry think tanks about blockchain's future impact to education. Let's start by looking at a list of some of the biggest consumer-facing tech companies that exist today. What do they all have in common? Here's a hint. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no taxis. Facebook, the most popular content provider, writes no content. Alibaba, the world's most valuable retailer, owns no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodations provider, owns no rental property. Here's a hint. In 1998, we were told not to get into strangers' cars and don't meet people from the internet. In 2016, we literally summoned strangers from the internet to get in their cars. It's a totally different world. The answer is that each one of these companies deliver tremendous value in their respective categories, not by owning physical products, but by operating trust networks, connecting riders to drivers, buyers to sellers, and travelers to accommodations. Together, these intermediaries generate over $1 trillion in value. Facilitating trust is good business. And at the core of each trust network, the most valuable and protected ingredient are ledgers. Ledgers that record detailed information about us and our transactions. Ledgers that confirm ownership, identity, status, and authority. Today, our ledgers exist in the form of complex databases and giant data centers. By owning our data and facilitating our transactions, these central authorities now secure most of our digital livelihood. But what happens when our middlemen aren't secure with our valuable data? Like in August 2013, when Yahoo reportedly had all 3 billion of their user accounts hacked and didn't fully disclose it for three years. Or more recently, last September, when Equifax's servers were compromised, releasing half of the US population's personal records into the wild. We're talking about social security numbers that can't be changed. If a publicly traded $10 billion corporation can't keep our digital records safe, who can? And what happens when these middlemen have too much power to manipulate our data subversively? In this example, administration at a local California community college were given bribes to change grades. It can be tough to ensure authenticity when the middlemen own the only system of record. 
Lastly, what happens when these central authorities don't work in the best interest of the people they serve? That happened in 2008 with the subprime mortgage crisis. The trust networks here were banks and hedge funds driven by poor self-regulation and aggressive loan practices. This ended up requiring a complete bailout of the U.S. financial system, injecting cash right back into the very middlemen that caused a global financial crash. Bitcoin was developed as a direct response to this catastrophic event, the world's first digital currency controlled by no central authority, with the goal of putting financial control back into the hands of the people. The issue has always been that whoever controls the ledger has undue power and influence over it. Bitcoin proposes in an era of modern technology, what if we could have rules without rulers, by placing the ledger directly into the currency itself, creating a digital currency with transparent, open source software algorithms that do the work of traditional middlemen. The currency wouldn't be owned or operated by a single entity, but exists solely as a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer software network, where anyone could participate by simply downloading and running an app. Each node would maintain a copy of the same global ledger, issuing and managing transactions via intelligent group consensus algorithms designed in its open source software. No one knew at the time, but this distributed ledger technology, the backbone of our first digital currency, would come to be known as the blockchain. And what started as a grand experiment in 2009 has grown into the world's largest bank with no physical cash, with a market cap of over $200 billion today. To put that into perspective, that's two times the market cap of both Uber and Airbnb combined, and even larger than Goldman Sachs effectively making Bitcoin tied as the fourth largest financial institution in the U.S. It's no wonder Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, called it a fraud last September. It's like asking a taxi driver what they think of self-driving cars. Bitcoin and its underlying technology is changing what's now possible in the financial industry, whether the existing financial middlemen like it or not. And unlike the other entities, Bitcoin has no need to make profit. But despite the almost ubiquitous buzz about Bitcoin today, it wasn't an overnight success. Bitcoin has gradually risen from $0.05 cents a coin in 2009 to over $10,000 per coin today, with an all-time high of $20,000 earlier this year. Every step of the way from $0.10 cents in 2009 to $10 in 2010 to $10,000 today, pundits and traditional financial experts have been predicting Bitcoin's demise. Despite threats from both governments and hackers alike, Bitcoin and its ledger technology has successfully secured billions of dollars of digital value for almost a decade without fail. And when even strong-armed communist governments fail to stamp out this new democratic technology within their country, it's beginning to earn the respect of even some of its most fiercest opponents. Earlier this month, even Jamie Dimon publicly stated that he regrets calling Bitcoin a fraud and says he believes in the technology behind it. This nearly decade-long success has proven Bitcoin's ledger technology works, spurring the creation of an entire new blockchain industry supported by hundreds of new blockchain-based digital currencies. These new coins, dubbed cryptocurrencies, have names like Ethereum, Ripple, and NEO, and are all running their own public blockchains. They contribute to a new decentralized token commodity market with a market cap of over $500 billion today, and is expected to exceed $1 trillion by the end of this year. These cryptocurrencies built on Bitcoin's foundation each offer new innovations taking blockchain technology to the next level. Like Ripple, a cryptocurrency platform that the Gates Foundation's Financial Services for the Poor has recently partnered with. Gates uses Ripple's open source technology to level the economic playing field for the 2 billion people globally who are trapped in poverty without access to a bank account or other basic financial services. Unlike traditional banks, Ripple enables secure, global, and nearly instant financial transactions at close to zero cost, thanks to its blockchain technology. Ripple also provides trusted payment gateways without the need for a bank, allowing any organization or person to act as their own payment gateway. And financial applications for cryptocurrencies are just the tip of the iceberg. These new blockchain networks offer compelling new ways of rethinking not just currency systems, but ownership, governance, corruption and censorship resistance, fundraising, community, and economic incentives. Still, at the root of this innovation is the original blockchain technology developed for Bitcoin. And before we dive further into specifics, we really need to answer the big question, what is the blockchain? How does it actually work? How is it doing something new that we haven't already done before? 
To understand blockchain technology, it first helps to understand the philosophy of what it's trying to achieve, the social value proposition, which was to design an incorruptible and transparent system of record in a digital world where it's been traditionally impossible to do so. As we've seen, having centralized gatekeepers responsible for our systems of records in any and all systems create the potential for insecurity and corruption. Our trust failures that exist today are often at the most basic level. The blockchain set out to develop a new paradigm of trust, one that replaces traditional trust with cryptographic proof and group consensus. It's based on three simple tenets that are easy to understand. The first is that there is no alchemy. Nothing on the blockchain can be produced out of thin air or faked, including the currency that powers the system. There is always transparent proof or transactional evidence of why and how a record was produced. Two, no altering. As a tamper-proof system, blockchain is designed to be an immutable system of record. That means records can only be added, never modified or deleted. And third, no impersonation. Blockchains are designed to never trust, but always verify. It uses cryptography, a form of encryption, so that you are who you say you are, and nobody can impersonate you, even if your account is anonymous. With those concepts in mind, the blockchain in its simplest form is an ever-expanding transactional ledger. It's a global ledger full of everyone's transactions on the network since the beginning of time. Anyone running the software can see this ledger, but that doesn't mean there's no privacy. For example, in Bitcoin's blockchain ledger, we don't see people's full names, but transactions from one digital wallet address to another. The transactions then become public record, but the wallet addresses are essentially anonymous. But here's where things get really interesting. Newer blockchains take things a bit further than Bitcoin, as blockchains can store more than just payment transactions. They can record transactions for anything of value, from land and home titles, medical records, school transcripts, to grades and learning progress. Because ledgers are immutable, it ensures a particular home can only be owned by one person, that a student can't change their grades, or a person can't vote twice. This doesn't prevent updates. If a grade needs to be changed, for example, then a new transaction is added to the bottom of the ledger with a new timestamp. The old grade still exists for record keeping. At this point, you might ask, well, how can we guarantee that entries haven't been changed or hacked discreetly? That's where a key part of the blockchain architecture comes into play a tamper-proof design so smart that the technology is named after it. You see, transactions are never actually recorded directly to the ledger, but are first bundled into a block of transactions on a set interval. These blocks are given a block ID that is an encrypted digital fingerprint of the contents of that block. In computer science terms, this is known as a hash. This means that if the contents of the block ever change, even by a single letter, its unique ID will also change letting the network know that this block was modified. But what prevents someone from just deleting the whole block or sneaking in their own block? The blockchain also addresses this by making the ID of every block not just a hash of its own content, but also mixes in the ID of the previous block that came right before it. This means if someone were to try to modify an old transaction, delete an entire block of transactions, or even insert a fake block of made up transactions, it would break the fingerprint relationship it has with its own preceding blocks. This chain of tamper-proof digital fingerprints is where the chain in blockchain comes from. Zooming out back to the decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network aspect of the blockchain network, the ledger we just talked about doesn't just exist on one machine, but it's identical across every computer running the blockchain software. Each node receives new transactions at the same time, ensuring the ledger is always available. And when a new block of transactions needs to be processed, every computer on the network verifies it independently through its own historical blockchain. This ensures no node is required to trust any other node. This is how we can maintain trust in a network powered by strangers. Any node that doesn't come up with the same majority consensus as everyone else gets pushed out of the network. This keeps nefarious hackers out of the system. There's just one last key component to this blockchain ecosystem to help complete the loop. Every time a new blockchain of transactions is created, it needs a secure hash ID, which we talked about earlier. The first node in the network to compute the hash ID is awarded newly minted digital tokens by the network. This process is called mining from its similarity to mining actual minerals out of the ground. A node gets rewarded for its time and energy doing valuable work by receiving an asset of value. This makes cryptocurrency a critical component for public blockchains. 
It's the incentive that drives people to host a node and mine blocks, not just as a volunteer, but for personal profit. The act of mining helps secure blockchains because it's computationally very hard to do. This is intentional, so that no single computer is strong enough to mine every block first. A whole global network of computers are in direct competition. Mining also gives the system a fair and limiting way of distributing its digital coins. This means every coin in circulation today came from someone who mined it. Mining creates the final incentive loop that keeps the blockchain well adopted and running for theoretically eternity. Though the concepts we've used to describe the blockchain so far are simplified, they give us enough of a solid understanding of this technology to get us to the real value of this presentation, and that's what we can do with blockchain today. Blockchains 2.0 is where we'll start to see some major applications, including in the education space. Bitcoin was created in 1999 and gave us the whole concept of the blockchain and its ability to decentralize trust on the internet. Though people are still doing notable things with the Bitcoin blockchain, even verifying college transcripts on it, it really wasn't built for more than managing its own digital currency. Though Bitcoin is still the most well-known cryptocurrency and largest by market cap, Bitcoin can now be considered the 1.0 of blockchain. Today, Ethereum is the second largest cryptocurrency platform after Bitcoin with around a $100 billion market cap. It came out in 2015 with even larger aspirations than Bitcoin. Ethereum introduces Blockchain 2.0 with a vision to move past being a world ledger to being a world computer. It does this by introducing the concept of smart contracts. Smart contracts are powerful, self-executing custom lines of computer code that handle the enforcement, management, performance, and payments of contracts between people and companies. Ethereum introduced the concept of hosting entire applications called decentralized apps or dApps on the blockchain by way of these smart contracts. Its blockchain is essentially a blockchain-based distributed computing platform. There are now over a thousand Ethereum dApps to date, though most are early prototypes and experiments. With dApps, Ethereum functions like a decentralized app store, where anyone can publish applications directly to the blockchain, bypassing proprietary software distribution channels like Apple, Google, Microsoft, and their subsequent restrictions, licensing, and fees. For example, imagine a decentralized Twitter that's resistant to censorship, or the ultimate open source education platform that is free from corporate ownership and influence. Dapps are typically open source and operate autonomously. They can't be taken down or censored as they exist across an entire global public blockchain network, not on a centralized server. Brave Browser is an example of another feature that makes Ethereum unique, the ability to make application-specific tokens on its blockchain. That means Brave doesn't have to set up and manage its own separate blockchain network, but piggyback on Ethereum's instead. Brave is a web browser with an alternative advertising model. It works by tracking and paying users for their ad watching in cryptocurrency. The browser awards users in its own currency called the Basic Attention Token, or BAT. In Brave's ecosystem, the BAT token is used as a unit of account between advertisers, publishers, and users. Can you imagine scholarships or other student incentives run on the same token system? Brave was created by Brandon Icke former Mozilla CEO and creator of the JavaScript programming language. Filecoin is a great example of how the buying, earning, and spending of a utility token can help regulate an incentive-based ecosystem from within a platform. Filecoin is a decentralized data storage network. Think of it as a peer-to-peer -peer Dropbox, as well as the name of its actual currency. Anyone can earn Filecoin by running software to automatically rent out disk space on their computer, other users can utilize the service by buying and spending Filecoin to host their files. This relationship allows anyone to make money from their free hard drive space while also giving other users who need it a way cheaper alternative to Dropbox. Everypedia is a great example of a cryptocurrency used as an incentive-based solution to a problem with existing applications. They've been developing a new take on Wikipedia that solves two main problems. One, the articles are created by unpaid volunteers, which leads to two, the quality of Wikipedia's content varying wildly. Everypedia tackles this issue with its own token called IQ, which is awarded for the generation of good content. Editors use these IQ tokens to submit articles and edits for more tokens. These tokens can be redeemed for Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies at any time. 
If the article is approved by fellow editors in good standing, the user gets awarded more IQ tokens as her reputation improves. If the article or edit is rejected by her peers, the editor loses her submission token and eventually can't submit any more articles unless she buys more. In this way, Everipedia ensures that editors are shareholders of the platform. Dr. Larry Sanger, the co-founder of Wikipedia, liked the concept so much that he joined the company as CIO. These are just two examples out of a sea of new token-based applications, though most are still experimental. It's important to note that outside of their use in creating sustainable ecosystems within blockchain applications, these utility tokens have had tremendous impact in the startup space in another way, by revolutionizing the model for how startups are funded and bootstrapped. This new form of bootstrapping involves startups pre-mining an allotment of tokens and selling them to the public in a process called a crowd sale. This is done via a pre-launch offering period called an initial coin offering, or ICO. Though these tokens are meant to pay for access and usage of the future blockchain service, they are generally sold at a fraction of their potential future value, so are picked up by investors as an indirect means of investing in the company. In this way, blockchain startups can raise funds in a decentralized manner without the need for traditional venture capital. This is yet another novel idea introduced by the blockchain, solving the startup bootstrap problem via the token economy. ICOs exploded in popularity in 2017, with token sales rising over $2.3 billion globally by last September. That's more than the equivalent venture capital funding during the same period. Though this has caused a rapid proliferation of low-quality and fraudulent coin sales, regulation is still murky and most tokens still aren't considered securities by the SEC. Despite the controversy, many people in the blockchain community think that ICOs are a long-awaited solution for nonprofit foundations to raise capital, especially if they want to build open-source software. ICOs are a new way to fund shared infrastructure projects that couldn't easily be funded before. For example, Ethereum itself raised $18 million in its original 2014 crowd sale, the largest ever at the time. Brave Browser generated $35 million for its BAT ICO in May in about 30 seconds, compared to the $7 million it raised using traditional venture funding. Some experts believe that this tokenized economy will be a major component of our decentralized future, and even old global brands are starting to reinvent themselves using ICOs. A few months ago, Kodak announced they'd be launching their own cryptocurrency, Kodak Coin, with an ICO which will be complete at the end of this month. Kodak partnered with a company called Wen Digital on the initiative, with the cryptocurrency underpinning an encrypted digital ledger of rights ownership for photographers. The company's stock price jumped 44% on the news. There is now a constant stream of scheduled ICOs, even in education, at any given moment. Here are two pages of listings on ICObench.com with the education tag. Though there are clearly some low quality and questionable startup ideas being floated, there are many diamonds in the rough, as it's never been easier to promote powerful new ideas with blockchain technology combined with a brand new token-based economy. For example, this is the CrowdSell launch page for BitDegree, a blockchain-powered online education platform that successfully closed $22 million in funding from its ICO in December. BitDegree markets itself as the world's first blockchain-powered online education platform that uses token scholarships for tech talent acquisition. They claim to offer students quality online courses with a transparent blockchain-based reward system and achievement tracking. They advertise the platform courses to be affordable and often free for students as future employers are the ones sponsoring courses based on the skills they need. So what prevents an ICO startup from cutting and running after a successful token sale? It happens, but like any legitimate startup, you have a publicized startup team from CEO, engineers, to advisors that all have their reputations on the line. More significantly, for a startup with serious vision, raising money through the token sale doesn't create long-term value, just a relatively small bootstrap to execute a vision and introduce their token. Blockchain companies often lock up and reserve 10-50% to 50 of their total supply of currency for their founding team, advisors, and ongoing overhead. The value of these tokens are what generates long-term value for the company, much like stock. For example, BitDegree's BDG token is already trading at four times its ICO value on the exchanges even though it was only released last month. The key to trust and diligence in an ICO world is the white paper. Since ICOs generally raise funding on the promise of some future technology, the white paper is the key pitch document to potential investors in preparation for a launch. This is the first two pages of BitDegree's 36-page paper.
the white paper details the commercial, technological, and financial details of the project and coin offering. It lists everything from the problem it's addressing, the vision and roadmap, the team, its budget allocation, how its tokens will be used internally, and of course the token distribution. Simply put, it's everything you need to know about the currency before making your mind up on if you want to invest, purchase, or use it. The white paper is a cornerstone of diligence, but investors look at many other clues of quality blockchain investments. Here's another education ICO, LiveEDU, which has a goal of being the YouTube for online education. Some projects die, others get stalled for months and years, and some were just never good to begin with. One big question is, is it really a smart blockchain and cryptocurrency project with a real reason for a cryptocurrency, or is it just creating an ICO for quick money? Other obvious questions include, is there a strong team with a proven track record, a solid working product or proof of concept, an active GitHub repository to back it up? What about social media, brand presence, and following? Is the outline market cap and amount of funds being collected realistic for the product being developed? These are the same general concepts as investing in any standard startup. This strange new world of cryptocurrency and ICOs isn't for every organization, just a requirement for decentralized public blockchain platforms. But blockchain technology is flexible. Let's talk about private blockchain networks, ones run more traditionally on paid cloud servers that avoid the need for volunteer, peer-to-peer -peer networks and cryptocurrency. These platforms differ on the more rigid tenets of blockchain's decentralized security principles, but are optimized for corporate use and have started to get some major adoption. Most commonly, these take the form of blockchain as a service cloud platforms hosted by our tech giants like Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, and Amazon. These platforms make it easy for organizations and even governments to set up trusted private blockchain networks supporting diverse use cases in industries from finance, healthcare, support chain and rights management, to government, insurance, and often handhold their customers through the entire process. Today, the enterprise market leader is IBM's blockchain for business platform. It took three years to develop and is said to employ 1,500 employees. IBM's blockchain is built on top of Hyperledger Fabric, an open source collaboration version of blockchains focused on business-oriented use cases, not cryptocurrencies. Hyperledger is an active repository of these open source blockchain platforms. It was created in 2015 by the Linux Foundation with member contributions and guidance from everyone from IBM and Cisco to JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Accenture. When we look at applying blockchain technology to our problems in education, IBM has many high profile partnerships that are showing off not only what is possible, but what is actually being implemented and tested through active pilots. For example, IBM's blockchain platform is working with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Center for Disease Control, who are exploring the use of blockchain for the secure storage and exchange of electronic medical records. IBM is also working with the government of Dubai to increase safety and efficiency of cross-agency data sharing. In a separate report, Dubai has set itself a goal of becoming the world's first blockchain-powered government to utilize the technology for all transactions by 2020. When 143 million social security numbers were compromised by the Equifax hack, it put the spotlight on the fact that Americans' national identity system is untenable. Digital identity is another area where blockchain can help. IBM is partnering with SecureKey Technologies to build the first ever digital identity network in Canada. The network will be designed to make it easier for consumers to verify they are who they say they are in a privacy-enhanced, security-rich and efficient way. When launched later this year, consumers can use the network to instantly verify their identity for services such as new bank accounts, driver's license, or utilities. IBM has even partnered with Walmart, who is spearheading a blockchain-based food safety initiative. They are working on using blockchain to improve transparency and traceability in their food supply chain, along with nine food giants including Unilever, Nestle, and Dole. Using the blockchain, they are working on revamping the way their data is managed across a complex network of farmers, brokers, distributors, processors, and retailers. Their goal is to cut investigations into foodborne illnesses like this summer's fatal salmonella outbreak from weeks down to seconds. Along with streamlining food safety, IBM experts believe we may even see these systems marketed in a similar way on food labels, improving customer confidence in what they buy. With the blockchain, non-GMO, USD organic, or fair trade coffee could all be backed by the instant reinsurance of a blockchain logo certifying provenance. 
and IBM's blockchain supports smart contracts too. They're actively used in their partnership with Marsk, the world's largest shipping firm. In March, Marsk completed its first pilot to track its cargo on the blockchain. A study conducted by Marsk in 2014 showed that on average, about 30 organizations are involved in the shipment of a product, resulting in over 200 separate interactions. By moving the expensive, time-consuming paperwork for each transaction to a blockchain-based smart contract system, they plan to cut shipping fraud and save costs. The critical thing is that the entire process, from when the purchase order is made, all the way to when goods are delivered, are captured as smart contracts on the blockchain. IBM has a goal of capturing data on as many as 10 million containers by the end of 2017. Now that we've got an idea of what blockchain is, how it works, and how it's being used across industries, we've got a great perspective to look at more education applications. Blockchain for education is still in its infancy, but industry think tanks see great potential for blockchain to disrupt education in four categories. We have identity and student records, where the blockchain can improve how we identify students, protect their privacy, measure, record, and credential their accomplishments, and keep these records secure. Next, we have student debt and finance, how we value and fund education and reward students for the quality of their work. Then, new pedagogy, where blockchains can play an important role in the development of new models of learning as we continue to move past the traditional broadcast model. And the fourth category, the meta-university, how the blockchain can contribute to entirely new models of education that support open access and lifelong learning. Let's start with identity and student records, where blockchain technology has made inroads to better manage student records and accelerate the end of a paper-based system for certificates. In our last presentation on AI, we discussed the need for a shared national post-secondary data system. It would be a central collection of modern key performance metrics for all students in all institutions, something previously outlined by Gates Grant Organization, but not yet implemented. As we saw in our IBM pilots, a blockchain could be the unifying technical solution for this type of complex cross-organization data sharing initiative. As an always-on distributed database, the blockchain can provide the tamper-proof system of record we need to confidently host our educational data and securely share it among permissioned organizations. Public blockchain platforms inherently have no central authority or direct ownership which can best support decentralized public systems of records like this. By their nature, they are run as transparent utilities that are steered by a consortium but a funded private blockchain service could certainly be easier to get off the ground. In August, Sony Global Education, a subsidiary of Sony, announced that it had finished developing such a platform, storing and managing educational records on the IBM blockchain platform. IBM's private blockchain platform provides companies with the control assurances they need to pilot initiatives like this. It's a powerful start. Sony's educational records platform includes degrees, diplomas, assessments, and testing scores for both primary and higher education. Sony's press releases don't give many details on this platform yet, though they've publicized an exciting focus on open sharing of academic proficiency. They are looking to commercialize this product as a global service with selected educational institutions later this year. Moving on to the promise of learner-owned credentials, this is a place where blockchain has seen great early adoption in higher education, so we'll look at it in detail. The concept of digitizing credentials is nothing new, and you're likely already familiar with Mozilla Open Badges. It's a standard first released in 2012 for embedding accomplishments in portable image files as digitally verifiable badges. As of January 2017, it's now an IMS standard used by thousands of organizations in the alternative micro-credentialing space. But it was never designed for securing high-stakes credentials like diplomas. That's where BlockCerts comes in. BlockCerts imagines what an academic degree would look like, what functionality it would provide if it were designed today. It combines the issuer, earner, and displayer model of open badges and integrates the security, permanence, and accessibility features of the blockchain. BlockSearch is an open standard for creating, issuing, viewing, and verifying blockchain-based digital certificates. BlockSearch keeps its schema as close to the Mozilla Open Badges specification as possible. It's Open Badges compliant, but it's its own open source project. Any university can leverage this technology for free today, and most of our early adopters are using it. 
It was originally developed as a research project at MIT's Media Lab and open source in partnership with an educational technology startup called Learning Machine in October of 2016. MIT's Media Lab, an early pioneer in blockchain for education, has actually been using blockchain-based certificates since 2015 using the Bitcoin blockchain. This summer, the Institute expanded a pilot to issue blockchain-backed digital diplomas to a cohort of 111 graduates along with its traditional format. And they're not the only ones. On the world stage, the University of Nicosia in Cyprus has been using academic certificates on the Bitcoin blockchain since 2014 and expanded to all diplomas in the spring of 2017. NGN Polytechnic in Singapore also started issuing their diplomas via the blockchain through a partnership with Singapore-based digital certificate startup, ATORS. They expect blockchain distribution of academic certificates to speed up recruitment for job seekers and the admission processes for students. This technology enables potential employees and universities to spend less time manually verifying a candidate's academic credentials. And this year, Malta became the first national government to trial blockchain for education certificates as a nation. This island nation has been very bullish on this technology, already having a national blockchain strategy with a dedicated advisory board. In college alternative circles, San Francisco-based Halberton School of Software Engineering is notable as the first accelerated programming school to also supply its academic certificates on the blockchain, further validating these types of certificates as an alternative to traditional diplomas. Blockcert seems to be the biggest open source player in this credential space, so what does Blockcert do that Open Badges doesn't? Both issue and even verify records of achievement, but like its name implies, Open Badges focuses on less formal and more granular competencies. It was intentionally designed to promote weird and wonderful badges and alternative micro credentials that are the opposite of high stakes formal certificates. For those high stakes credentials, BlockSearch leverages the blockchain to provide the infrastructure to confidently secure and authenticate professional certificates for a lifetime. It is also worth noting that BlockSearch stores a hashed digital fingerprint of the certificate document on the blockchain, so we never have personal information at risk on the blockchain itself. And because it's recorded to a public blockchain, it's hosted as a permanent record that is designed to exist indefinitely and to always be accessible. That is the nature of public blockchain networks. They are designed to be permanent public utilities. This is in contrast to traditionally hosted digital diplomas, verification websites, or school APIs, which each have their issues. Even the universities themselves may cease to operate 5 to 25 years down the road, taking their systems of records with them. The last benefit of storing proof of certification on public blockchains is efficiency and cost. Utilizing public infrastructure and open source standards, it's free for the student and cheap for the verifier or employer. Due to the incentive nature of public blockchain networks, there is a small transaction charge to the issuing university to issue certifications as they become transactions on the ledger. But that cost is generally negligible, averaging cents per certificate. The minimal cost is easily offset by the blockchains maintaining those records for a lifetime. If this all sounds rather complicated, it's actually made pretty easy and user-friendly by way of mobile app. The student downloads the open source BlockCerts mobile app and creates an account. The student then adds their university as an issuer for their diploma. The app automatically creates the necessary private encryption keys behind the scenes, abstracting away all the complexity. Another powerful aspect of this new digital authentication system for institutions is the ability to access validation analytics. This is one of the areas that Learning Machine, the startup that helped pioneer Blockcerts, has been innovating. Learning Machine has been developing a commercial platform to support Blockcerts' use in not only education, but for government and workforce as well. As seen here, institutions can leverage post-graduation analytics to see which degrees and related departments are being viewed, shared, and verified the most. In the future, Blockcerts plans to add a few new features including the right to curation, allowing fully featured selective disclosure within a single certificate to construct different narratives for different purposes, and adding tracking metrics useful to both the institution and the graduate. 
One last block search topic before we move on, the incentive for institutions. In a world of proliferating digital credentials, the potential for exaggeration, misrepresentation, credential inflation, and fraud is high. For the institution, the blockchain can cut down on degree fraud and protect the integrity of the credentials they issue, promoting transparency and trust in the system of accreditation. But from an operational and business perspective, universities can also cut down on administrative costs, eliminating paperwork, and antiquated processes needed to support manual degree verification. And frankly, smart campus solutions like blockchain also help market a technology-centric, forward-thinking university, a marketing move that has likely compelled many of our existing early adopters. All right, let's move on to our second area, student debt and finance. Mountain View, California-based WeTrust is a noteworthy blockchain and smart contract-based platform in the financing space. They build financing platforms for underserved communities based on social capital and trust networks. Their first product is Trusted Lending Circles, which allows adults that don't have access to traditional credit lines the ability to build up and access credit with trusted groups powered by blockchain. Trusted Lending Circles is a decentralized rotating savings and credit association, or ROSCA, which allows anyone, including students needing financial support, to create their own lending circle. Like regular ROSCAs, these circles are groups of individuals who agree to meet for a defined period in order to save and borrow together, a form of combined peer-to-peer -peer banking, lending, and mutual insurance. By moving traditional ROSCAs to the blockchain, WeTrust enables autonomous and secure P2P lending services that are automated through user-defined smart contracts. They also build a blockchain-based credit identity with a risk profile derived from their past transactions on the blockchain. All right, let's move on to our third area, new pedagogy, where blockchain-based smart contracts have huge potentials to execute on some of our far-flung ideas in education. As colleges and universities look to move past the traditional broadcast model and support more interactive, adaptive, and incentivized mastery of knowledge, Ethereum's smart contracts and the issues of tokens to members is breaking new grounds in management science. For example, in an organizational structure called a holacracy, all decision-making is distributed through self-organized teams rather than a management hierarchy, which promotes a collaborative rather than a hierarchical process for defining and aligning the work to be done. Educal sees this as an entrepreneurial approach to school leadership and a model for classroom collaboration where top-down administration is replaced by an incentivized system for teamwork. Students could identify what needs to be learned, agree on their roles, responsibilities, and rewards, and then codify these rights and rewards to be executed as a smart contract. In another example, what if students could literally get paid for their time on task in self-driven learning environments powered by smart contracts? My Time is an example of a blockchain platform designed to support such a goal. It's designed to integrate paying users of a particular service or application for their attention and time using cryptocurrency. It's similar to the concept we mentioned earlier from Brave Browser, but designed to be a flexible integration platform. We could imagine something like this being a component of an adaptive learning platform. It uses smart contracts and the blockchain to ensure certain actions are met, like watching a video or completing an assignment. Utilizing such a system, students could be self-incentivized to learn, being automatically awarded grant money or perhaps unlocking chunks of their own scholarship money for time on task as they complete the assignments, attend class, and successfully acquire credits. Lyceum is a similar platform that applies this concept directly to learning and education. They've developed a proof of learning protocol on the Ethereum blockchain, which can confirm that a student has demonstrated mastery in a given topic using a combination of peer evaluation and computational sign-off. Their smart contract system is designed to intelligently disperse funds to students to reward mastery-based learning and keep students progressing in their track. It's a building block for a loftier goal of providing an entire marketplace for talent evaluation and acquisition. They want this system to refocus learners toward the skills that are needed by real employers with a place for investors and employers to back undervalued skills and assets. This allows learners to earn money to learn those in-demand skills. This edtech startup is in the very early stages on AngelList, so it remains to be seen what they're able to deliver. Since Ethereum's DAP platform is still in its infancy, we are just now seeing incentivization tokens leveraged in early education applications, like OTLW. It's a decentralized system for peer assessment, 
based on a participatory token economy and advanced game theory concepts like shelling point to validate quality assessment. In OTLW, you get tokens through assessment and you pay with them to get assessed. Industry researchers like the EU's Joint Research Center are also expecting new transactional models to emerge that will affect how student educational materials are created, assessed, and monetized. There are already blockchains like Library that are being developed for decentralized IP management. These platforms allow anyone to register and monetize their intellectual property with 100% of the proceeds going to the authors. But with smart contracts, we expect to see even granular use cases. For example, when a student views a learning video, a small micropayment can be made to the video authors automatically. Many of these concepts also lend themselves well to our final category, the Meta University, where we take the concept of tying earning to learning and take it global. What if? What if learning were treated like a currency that could be traded or built into compensation? What if you can get paid to learn? What if we could radically decentralize learning and credentialing? What if a degree became more like an open ledger? What if no one ever graduated but continued gaining credentials that supported lifelong learning even past the classroom? What if anyone, anywhere, could be a teacher and grant learning credits to anyone else? The Institute of the Future and the ACT Foundation partnered to ask these very questions in an online experiment at learningisearning2026.org. They present a theoretical year of 2026 where closed transcripts and credentials are replaced by the ledger, a blockchain for tracking lifelong learning. It's designed to make learning measurable and recordable through EduBlocks, one-hour chunks from virtually any source, institutions, workplaces, apps, and people. Through the platform, thousands of teachers, students, administrators, and designers have been able to play with this what-if concept. Through simulation, the platform found popular support with many believing their EduBlock system was already real and not a prototype. People wrote in to sign up to teach, engineers offered to help scale up the platform. Though the project is a future experiment in collective imagination, they were surprised at how readily people thought of it as plausible and compelling. UK-based Center for Citizen Enterprise and Governance released a white paper in April outlining such a blockchain to track learning credits as a blockchain educational passport. Their Decentralized Learning Ledger, or DLL for short, is focused on capturing not only formal but also informal learning, tracking knowledge procurement from K-16 through through employment, continuing education, and forms of non-traditional learning. They are currently developing a two-year pilot with partners utilizing the concept of the white paper. As exciting blockchain platforms like this one are developed to secure a global network for higher learning, we can imagine students being able to receive a custom learning experience from a dozen different institutions while the blockchain serves to track the student's path and progress. Now let's brainstorm some ways the Foundation's U.S. programs could leverage blockchain technology in its solution areas. One obvious place to start is where blockchain is already finding the most traction in education, putting credential verifications in students' hands. Coding boot camps continue to be a popular bridge between education and employment. Just in October, shared workplace startup WeWork acquired Flatiron School, an in-person and online coding academy in New York City. They have plans to expand to many new campuses worldwide in support of their 170 plus WeWork co-working spaces. They plan to branch the school out from computer science education to cover other fields to promote what they call a new model for lifelong education. Halberton School uses blockchain-based validation to help legitimize coding bootcamps alternative credentials against traditional degrees. Encouraging the growth of block certs in the alternative credential space could be a worthwhile initiative. Learning Machine, co-creators of block certs, could be a great organization to partner with for initiatives as well. On the topic of issuing and recognizing credentials in an increasingly digitized world, there are grander visions as well. Instead of just verifying the credentials itself with the blockchain, we could also verify whether the certifying institution was legitimate, a process that becomes more important as we consider the hundreds of accredited pathways we have globally. With a form of multi-step accreditation as effective as block certs, employers or universities could know that not only was a prior awarded certificate issued legitimately, but that the institution who awarded it had valid accreditation and that the accrediting body for the institution has valid accreditation by its local authorities. If all organizations in this chain of accreditations had their digital signatures on the blockchain, this could be a fast and efficient process.
A blockchain-based process like this could improve the interoperability of international certificates helping migrants and refugees. It could also lend itself to the automatic recognition and transfer of credits between institutions. Another place we see immediate opportunities for the foundation is in actively monitoring and potentially sponsoring education-based blockchain ICOs. We believe ICOs will significantly impact how the next generation of education platforms are actually funded, distributed, secured, maintained, and incentivized. There are new blockchain-based startups offering decentralized versions of literally every popular company, product, and service offering, including our centralized giants we mentioned earlier decentralized social networks, rideshares, housing, and wholesale markets. We believe it will only be a matter of time before major blockchain players in the education space find their footing through this new token economy, and the foundation could help usher in that new era. The foundation could also help spearhead the development of public education-based services on the blockchain. For example, blockchain technology could be a realistic solution to our shared national post-secondary data system. As a public but secure decentralized blockchain service, Blockchain technology allows us to dream big by making a real lifelong learning ledger a possibility. The benefits of going the public blockchain route is that you gain a self-sustained public service incentivized by the token economy that should theoretically outlive the foundation itself. Going the private blockchain route like with Sony Education's student record initiative is likely an easier route with conventional hosting but also conventional costs and gatekeeping responsibilities. In either case, there are challenge grants and partnership opportunities abound in this space. The foundation could also investigate the potential benefits of leveraging smart contracts in its own grant making process. As we've seen, there are unique opportunities to leverage blockchain smart contracts in the financial aspects of education. For example, at the student level, scholarships could be incrementally awarded on the completion of coursework, a concept we haven't seen implemented yet, but one that is often mentioned by blockchain in education think tanks. Open educational resources is another area ripe for leverage with this decentralized technology. We haven't seen a blockchain platform specifically built for it, but Library comes close as being a community-run digital marketplace. Everpedia is a great example of using cryptocurrency to incentivize high-quality published work even on a network of free content. Emerging online education platforms built on the blockchain like Bitdegree and LiveEDU are attempting to create new online models that may succeed when mass online open courses and other online education platforms have stumbled, facing abysmal course completion rates. This is partly through the new token economy. For example, Bitdegree was able to bootstrap not only its funding, but also its student user base through its tokens. It used a cryptocurrency concept called airdropping to freely distribute some of its currency to 29 million users as an incentive to use the platform. It also uses gamification aspects of earning this currency to encourage course completion. Incentivization tokens for online education models may work extremely well or may fall flat. Only time will tell. Bitdegree was literally only funded 22 days ago, but we do feel they are headed in a promising direction. In closing, the blockchain began its journey with Bitcoin, which created the ability to decentralize trust through our first digital currency. Today, Bitcoin and now Ethereum have shown us things we considered impossible before. But the wave of innovation is still quite early for blockchain technology, which, just like cryptocurrency itself, is just now entering mainstream consciousness. Through all of this, we must remember that Google wasn't the first search engine and Facebook wasn't the first social media network. We will see success and failures as cryptocurrencies and the blockchain advance forward with new synergies into other existing technologies. Only one thing is for certain, the blockchain is quickly becoming a permanent part of our future. Though no technology is a silver bullet, the revolutionary concepts and enthusiasm now behind this technology are on the cusp of revolutionizing education and all major industries. We hope that some of this desk research has inspired you too. Now that you are informed participants of this blockchain discussion, we hope you'll be able to continue to steer this innovation towards those tough problems in education. The grand experiment kicked off by Bitcoin nine years ago continues. Thanks for listening. Questions, comments? We're here as a resource for you. Reach out to us at mavis at polyolagon.com and mark at polyolagon.com.